Chris, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Oh man, I don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> just start with a great big um. Yeah. <laughs> we're just <laughs> talking about. we're not supposed to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm Chris Marison. Uh, currently, I'm the founder and CEO of BlackRock Cannabis Company. Uh, we're a small licensed producer uh, based out of uh, Calgary, Alberta, holding a nursery license, micro cultivation license, and a standard processing license. You also worked with Arroya, um, were, was one of the co-founders and chief cultivator. Yeah, uh, I was. Um, now they're, they're a large publicly traded company and they have facilities. How, how, how many square foot are their facilities now across Canada? To be honest right now, I don't know how many, uh, they've scaled back considerably. There's been, uh, past few years have been, a uh, a pretty big period of uh, what they refer to as right sizing. Uh, the facilities number wise have, have dropped consistently or considerably. And in terms of actual square footage, it's, uh, it's dropped a lot. Are they strictly in Canada or are they doing international as well? Inter- uh, I believe we're, they're still international. You got to keep in mind, I have not been with them for over two and a half years now. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not totally, totally up to speed on exactly what they're doing and uh, where they're at, but I do believe they are still in some international markets. How, how did Arroyo Cannabis get started? So I had been involved with uh, various uh, kind of iterations of, of uh, medical cannabis licensing programs throughout Canada since basically the, the very first one. And um, I had been kind of communicating with Health Canada and Health Canada for lack of a better term would be like the equivalent of uh, the FDA in Canada. Oh, sorry. And um, yeah, they handle all of the licensing and uh, they're the ones who issue the cultivation licenses and whatnot for medical cannabis. So I've been uh, uh, working, uh, growing as a designated grower uh, for quite some time, I believe 2008, 2009. And I was given some feedback just some kind of constructive, not criticism, but just feedback, trying to help them uh, maybe see some sort of flaws in the system. There were definitely a lot of opportunities for uh, people to take advantage of it. And uh, I just basically started sending uh, emails that went went unanswered. And in 2012, I received an email from Health Canada saying, hey, you've expressed an interest in becoming a licensed producer, or sorry, not a licensed producer, they didn't even use that term at, at that time. But uh, you've extri- expressed an uh, interest in large-scale commercial cultivation of medical cannabis. We had a meeting we'd like you to attend, and it was for me, me only. I couldn't like um, transfer the invitation, and it was like a one-shot deal. So I went out there and sat in this room with a bunch of other people that were looking to uh, set up licenses and kind of got a glimpse in the future. And I was like, oh, wow, this is actually happening. Uh, so as soon as I got back uh, from that meeting reached out to a good friend of mine and uh, a business partner in the field of construction and said, hey, uh, he was looking into growing uh, commercial uh, hydroponic lettuce at that time. Um, I was like, hey, instead of lettuce, want to grow some cannabis? And he was, he was in. As soon as I mentioned to him, Dale was like, yeah, count me in. So we got talking. We are like, hey, well, what are we going to do? And it was actually some of the best advice I ever got. Uh, I was thinking quite a bit smaller scale. And he was like, no, 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 if we're going to do this, like, we got to go big. I'm like, well, why? He's like, it's way easier to raise millions than, than a few hundred grand. And I, I didn't really believe him at the time. I'm like, okay, cool. And sure enough, he was right. So you were one of the original, you were the original founder of Arroyo Cannabis. Yeah, you bet. So uh, it very quickly went uh, from me and uh, Dale jumped on board, like, instantaneously. And we started putting together a bit of a plan to... Um, to figure out what the hell to do. Because right now, like we knew that it was coming down the pipes, but uh, Health Canada hadn't, they hadn't really made the, the framework available. There was no real clear roadmap. There's no timelines. No one really knew. But they say a few people that had been in touch with them, you know, I'd probably say less than 100 people across the country, all of a sudden kind of got let in on this little secret that like, hey, like this is happening. This is going full federal. Yeah. Full federal. Uh, we knew at that point it was, it was strictly medical, uh, but we knew it was coming down the pipes. So there was an opportunity to put in a, 
a le- an application for a research and development uh, facility. So that's what we first did, um, which was good. That's how we kind of cut our teeth on the whole application process. Uh, neither one of us had any background in regulatory uh, affairs at all. So we were basically looking at this and like just, you know, fumbling our way through it and figuring it out, you know, step by step, which I think would really helped us. I mean, it seems like everybody was figuring it out back then, even can even Canada. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you were kind of guiding, um, the Canadian government on regulation and laws or mm-hmm. just kind of building the framework. Even, even before, absolutely. But even before then, uh, working with, you know, law enforcement, I remember when I got my first uh, cultivation license for medical, I was like, okay, cool. But then there was no real dialogue between Health Canada and law enforcement. So I'm like, this is great that I got this piece of paper on my wall. The the local RCMP, that's our federal police force, they don't know what the hell I'm doing. They have no clue anything about this license, anything about me. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I got got dogs at home. The time I was expecting my first daughter. Last thing I wanted was for a neighbor to be smell something on a day, call the cops and have my door kicked in. Because I, mean, I, I couldn't hold them accountable. I mean, I couldn't hold, I couldn't blame them, right? Yeah. So I reached out to them proactively. And that was interesting. But um, it actually worked out really well. I actually kind of like opened up a pretty good dialogue with them. And it was good. It uh, kind of uh, moved away from that us versus them mentality, you know what I mean? So, How large was your grow at the time? Just something small? Oh, my first one was for 10 plants. Okay. Yeah. And reached out and was like, hey, come check this out. Yep. And it was all good. Absolutely. Just, just got that dialogue going. And, and it was just to kind of have that open invitation where it's like, look, if you guys ever need to check something out, just give me a call. Knock on the door. But don't kick down my door. Yeah. You know, I've got a big dog and he's nice, but he's a grumpy, you know, giant Malamute, 120 pounds. Um, don't shoot my dog, please. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No. Yeah. The, uh, you and I met <clears throat> at Coachella. And what are the bit? Was that 13, 14? Something like that. Yeah. I think it was like 2014 Coachella at the hard rock pool party. We both had a, a we both got rooms next to each other and the hard rock pool party kind of just goes right into the rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, and having a drink, you know, hanging out, talking about cannabis. And at the time I owned a hydro shop and, you know, we just started talking about what you were doing, became friends, partied the whole weekend. And then I end up going up to Calgary and checking out the Arroyo facility. Um, and that's when it first, you guys first launched that you guys just started growing, right? Yeah. That time Aurora, yeah, that was probably a couple years in. So Back up real quick. After we went for the R and D um, license, we realized that that wasn't the way to go. Health Canada was like, "Look, anything you produce under an R and D license needs to be destroyed. Can't do anything with it." So we're like, "Okay, scratch that." Uh, and then before long, they actually put the framework in place to apply. Right. So we went through the actual application license. Um, at that point, we had a pretty good application put together. Uh, we need some money. We were working on our business plan, and uh, he was like, "Hey." My brother-in-law, you know, has done pretty well in business. I think we should reach out to him, not necessarily for money, but for some advice, right? Uh, Dale's whole thing, and I love this expression, is like, we, we always got to sit down and have turkey dinner uh, for Easter. I'm like, okay. Or Thanksgiving or whatever it was. I'm like, all right, makes sense. Well, as soon as we ran it by him, and like, we didn't even have a business plan put together yet. We were just starting that process, right? Uh, Steve, uh, who's one of the other general founders as well, um, was like, oh, you got to meet my, my business partner, Terry. And Terry Booth, uh, that's how he became a uh, CEO. And they came out to my little, my little medical girl, saw it. And I think that day we, or shortly after we had like a handshake deal and they were in. So I don't know how many companies of that scale ever get launched without even a business plan, but it can happen. Yeah. Now the, so that, at, at that, at that time is just research and development Yep. and you were able to grow and that was about the same size cultivation yeah so it, we didn't put, originally we were thinking greenhouse uh we shifted gears a little bit and went to a full indoor facility just to try to maintain better control uh, and at that time no one had really done large scale so we were kind of like okay well how do we adopt best practices from what we know and like from like legacy and medical on a small scale or even like some bigger like you know talking to people i knew i had maybe like, they were thinking back to like 20 lights you know like how do you make this work but then also talking to people that were in like commercial horticulture 
uh, we're like, hey, we know you guys grow tomatoes or peppers or cucumbers on scale, ornamentals or whatever. How do we do this uh, effectively on scale? Yeah, so you guys were like the first original large-scale cultivation, something that you're seeing all across the United States right now. But back then, it was just... So in, in Alberta, in our province, we were, the, we were the first to get licensed. There were other people. I think there was 12 or 13 uh, ahead of us, uh, potentially more, uh, across the country. But within our province, we were the first. How, how large was that first initial facility? Uh, 55,000 square feet. And then what was the... How, like you guys took an investment who put most of the money in and how did all that? So Steve and Terry put in the majority of the money to get, uh, to get started. Um, which definitely got us off the ground. We were able to build a facility, start hiring people, paying some salaries, buying equipment. Uh, we learned really quick how, uh, how long lead times some of these orders were and whatnot. And yeah, fumbled our way through it, you know, and everyone just did their best. Uh, we at that point we're still private. There is no thought of uh, the public markets at all, and so that's kind of when we first met. Um, I remember talking to you and you're like, "I'm sorry, how big? Like Fifty five thousand square feet?" Because at that time, Cali was what like ninety nine plants. Yeah, at that time we were still you know eight light, twenty light. You know, when you were a big grower, you had a hundred light facility, and you were the man. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, we're doing a thousand. You're like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's that's cool. I'm glad you I'm glad you actually took me up on the offer to come check it out because yeah, that was cool to show you around. And you're like, fuck, this guy's not lying. Like, okay, this is legit. This is happening. Yeah, I think where my head was at, I was just like, it's the biggest grow I've ever heard of at the time, fifty five thousand square feet, and I'm just like, I got to go see this thing and see what the future looks like because mm -hmm. Canada is definitely the future of the United States, obviously with federal legalization. But I wanted to take a look at it and kind of get an idea of, of what a big scale facility looks like. And um, no, it was rad. It was a good trip. I got sick halfway through, but um, now it's, now it's, you know, what, th two investors and you and Dell, um, you guys, when, how, what year did you guys decide to go public? Oh, so... I should really be careful and clarify when it came to the fundraising and, and uh, influx of cash and whatnot, uh, Terry and Steve stood up, uh, stood up and took care of that. And that was really taken off my plate. So for me at that point, it was focus on genetics, focus on cultivation, uh, figure it out on a large scale and figure out your team, like logistics, day-to-day -day operations. Uh, Dale was really tasked with building the facility, like get this thing up and running construction, and then ongoing maintenance and whatnot. But and we were still handling the the applications, like the licensing and whatnot. Because uh, I don't know if it's the same thing in the U.S. I, I imagine it is in some states, in some situations. Both Health Canada, it's an ongoing regulatory kind of process. You get your license, and there's another amendment, there's another change. I mean, you got to notify them of damn near everything. No, I remember being up there, and you had this like big, large, small warehouse that had to quarantine everything that came into the building. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, and you, you got pots that you have to quarantine. Mm -hmm. Like what? I didn't even understand why you'd need to quarantine pots or any of this. I, I, th I think what happened was, you know, once we jumped up from that scale and it was a big jump, right? Like for everyone involved when it comes to that scale of, of cannabis cultivation, um, and Health Canada was looking at it almost like pharmaceutical production. You know, they're talking about, they never, they never said GMP, like good manufacturing process, but they came up with an entirely new term called GPP, good production practices. So it was definitely heavily implied that you need to step it up. And this was not necessarily pharma production, but the, the closest you could get when, in terms of agriculture. So when you start talking with people, I mean, I had no experience in that field. Neither to Dale, neither to Steve, neither to Terry. We didn't know. So we looked at some pretty good consultants, uh, one of which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm still working with today. And people that came from that pharma world, you know, especially the good ones, took that time and really offered an education to people like myself and said, like, hey, like, here's some things you got to consider. I know you come from a background where, like, look, we're just growing some cannabis. Like, we're just growing some weed. It's not a big deal. I don't need to quarantine my plants or I don't need to quarantine my nutrients or I don't need to do tailgate testing on any of my inputs because if I screw it up, I mean, I'm going to know the plants are going to tell me if they're happy or not. Like cult cannabis cultivators are so good at just 
doing that dance day in, day out, just figuring it out. You know what I mean? What fires need to put out and how do you manage things? Does your AC go down? Is your humidity too high? What kind of pest pressure is there? You know, it's a constant, constant dance, you know? Um, whereas pharma, pharma's not like that. Pharma is like before you even sit down and start manufacturing some sort of, you know, drug, you know exactly what's going to look like every step along the way. And it's such a controlled environment. It's such a controlled process that if there's any deviation from that at any step, then you're like, whoa, some, some, that could affect the end outcome. And we're talking about someone that might get injected into you, someone that might be trying to save your life from cancer. You know what I mean? Like these yeah. are, this is some pretty serious shit, yeah. right? Um, and they can't really tolerate that deviation. For us, if we're like, ah, it wasn't the best run. You know, something happened in the room and my plants got stressed and yields went down or terps went down or uh, it just wasn't my best. It's still a sellable product. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's still not the end of the world. Like you got to work pretty hard, knock on wood, to really, really fuck up a crop. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is is Canada still that regulated? Yes. It's still that way for Absolutely. large producers. And the problem is, and this is one thing I'll never f- quite, and maybe it was a good, maybe it was a good thing we didn't go this route. But at that very first meeting way back in 2012 with Health Canada, they asked the question, do you want a set of kind of rules and SOPs to follow? And whether I'm right or wrong, at that time I put up my hand, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want that. But most of the other people in the room said no. So then we were left our own devices to figure it out. So you've got really well-meaning consultants and people that have, and some people internally on your team that come from that farm background that, you know, we're seeing now maybe push things a little too far. Like I personally don't, think it's necessary to gown up head to toe. I, I don't see the need for a beard net or a hair net. I just, I personally don't. If some dude can cook uh, like a Michelin five-star restaurant and not wear that, you know, why can't like... Uh, yeah, you're not injecting anything into your body. You're not no. making pharmaceuticals. You're cultivating something that is consumed just mm. like food. Yep. So it's, instead of being treated like a pharmaceutical company, probably should have treated more like you know, a restaurant or something. I'd rather have more, in my opinion, common sense practices put in place where you let people know, like, look, if you have your own small home grow in Canada, everyone can have four plants at home. Um, If you have any sort of pest, do me a favor, don't come to work or, or be extra diligent or can you wait to go to your garden after work? You know what I mean? Yeah. As opposed to just have everyone look like they're going into, you know, that scene from ET, you know, like, gown head to toe like there's some sort of alien presence do you know what i mean like i think it's overkill yeah but if you're working in some sort of crazy you know clean room making you know injectable drugs that's a different story so i I do think we kind of overshot it a little bit but there was we didn't know right and it was in the regs and and so what what health kind of did is they didn't say what you had to do they just said that you had to do you had to do something and then whatever you when you when you laid out in your sops that you're gonna do something then they held you to it they weren't saying that you're right or wrong per se, but they're like, well, you said you're going to do it. So now you got to do it. Yeah. How long did you guys, how long were you guys public, uh, private for? You know, I can't remember, recall exactly how long it, it went pretty quick. Like I want to say 2015, 2016. Uh, again, that wasn't my wheelhouse. So I don't know when Terry was having and, and the team, uh, were having those discussions to, to go public. Uh, we were part of that sort of initial kind of wave where everyone, not everyone, but the, the, the big guys definitely went public all at the same time. And it was that crazy, crazy explosion. I mean, yeah. What year did you guys go public? I, again, I think it was 2014, 2015, maybe 16. Yeah, I can't I think, remember off the top of my head. And what was your guys' peak valuation? Peak? Uh, I don't know if this is in Canadian or U.S., but we were just shy of $10 billion. Whoa. So you start this, you know, starts, you start pinging health, uh, you know, the Health Canada for a cannabis license and learning about, you know, this bringing some investors. It sounds like a, you know, initial four founders, right? Mm-hmm. And build this 55,000 square foot facility, take it public. And what, five, six years later, a $10 billion valuation. Keep in mind, I was still getting over the shock of walking into a 55,000 square foot facility. You know, I was, I was still in shock looking around being like, how the hell am I going to run this? You know, I had never run Argus before. You know, I had some really great people that kind of like, you know, took me aside and pat me on the shoulder and be like, dude, just breathe. You're going to be okay. 
I'm going to teach you, you, you got this, but I'm looking at this new piece of software that I'm like, what have I done? Like, what have I done? You know what I mean? That, that jump. And I know that if there's probably a lot of people listening to this right now that are like, yeah, I know, I know what it's like, like, you know, to go from that small, you know, and you're like, I know how to grow cannabis. I'm good at this. And they're like, okay, cool. Everyone needs that master grower, that master cultivator or whatever. Right. And then you, the, the jump is huge. Ast- astronomical huge. Yeah. I mean, you're going from probably a four light or, you know, let's say 10 plants, whatever, to 55,000 square feet. There's so many challenges. Mm-hmm. What what were some of the biggest challenges uh, scaling up like that? Everything that you run into in a small grow, you know, whether it's, and you know, all grows essentially the same, whether it's a closet grow, garage, basement, uh, small craft to these massive, they're all, they're all the same issues. It's why are your plants healthy? Is it environmental? Is it pest? Is it nutrients? You know, what's going on? What systems aren't working, right? Uh, so it's it's it, it's all the same, but just on a much different scale. So one day it would be emitters are clogged. One day it'd be we're getting some biofilm in the lines. One day it'd be pests. You know, it, it just it's that constant. You know, you just get something dealt with, and oftentimes it's at the expense of something else. Right when you're fighting fungus gnats, which you've never seen on that scale before, and you're like, "Whoa, okay, that 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 escalated quickly." You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do we do? Plus, you're also very limited to what you can use in terms of pest control products, right? You, in fact, there's pretty much nothing you can use that actually works. So, what do we do? And you're trying to get products in the door, but you got to quarantine them for X amount of weeks, and your problem's getting out of hand. And it's yeah, yeah. I think probably one of the biggest things would probably be talent density, because such a new industry and fifty five thousand square foot facility. There's not any really any of those, especially indoor facility. Mm-hmm. So you're dealing with air conditioning, lighting, energy, heat, humidity, <clears throat> bugs cultivating plants at scale and and not having the right talent on the team or somebody you can kind of you know lean on that's done it before because nobody's done it before we were all like going through it together yeah and so th- that that was that was what was really important was just making sure you had those that key group of people uh, that you just tried to make sure that you know you try to keep ego out try not I mean I, I struggled a lot I had no formal management training at all like zero, you know, and now imagining like a, like a team of people, like a big team of people, they got so big. I couldn't remember everyone's name before, before too long. And I didn't like that. And all of a sudden I'm like, who's, who's that? Who's a new girl? She's been here for like weeks. I'm like, Oh shoot. Okay. Like, you know, you feel bad about that. Yeah. Um, and you're trying your best, but at the same time, then you got all your personal stuff too, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's a lot. And it's, it's, a, it was a huge, huge, huge learning curve and uh, definitely a, a big part of my life for sure. When did you uh, leave uh, Aurora? So Aurora would have been, it was actually a week before the world ended. So the start of March, 2020. Okay. Right, right before COVID. Like literally a week. So the timing was actually perfect to be honest with you. Did, it seemed like in our industry down here in the United States, uh, during COVID, it just went, our industry went bananas. Did you see the same kind of thing up in Canada? We were on the we were already on the decline a little bit because of the public markets, right? Uh, I think they pretty much peaked in around 2018, mm-hmm. right when we had federal legalization in, in October 2018. And we kind of all thought, you know, I don't know if it was, it, I don't know if we're all just greedy uh, or we just didn't know any better or we just thought it wasn't going to end. But I mean, when you're almost a $10 billion company, and don't get me wrong, we it was all it was all speculative. Uh, we had some massive facilities. You know, nearly a million square feet uh, by the Edmonton Airport in Leduc. I mean, a million square feet. You think fifty-five thousand square feet is big? A million is insane. Was that mixed like greenhouse? Yeah, yeah. And then that was, and even that was enough. Then we we're building another one in Medicine Hat. That was, I think, one was supposed to be close to one and a half million square feet. And then there's stuff happening in in uh, Denmark or Norway and like all over the place. It was, you know, I think we were pushing three thousand employees at the time. Whoa over 2,500, know that much. And it just, you know, but, but still, even though there was so much potential and it was like, well, if we, you know, when we built 55,000 square feet, we sold everything. We couldn't keep, we could not grow enough. So then we grabbed another facility, couldn't grow enough. And then buying companies, mergers, acquisitions, and you still can't grow enough. It made sense that we got to keep, we got to keep going. That's what the markets wanted, right? 
That's what investors wanted. But it's still, when I realized, I'm like, we're worth more than Air Canada. I, was like the, I think it's, they're the biggest airline in Canada. You know, I'm looking around at Donami one day. We're flying, I think we're flying to Vegas for the show. I'm like, they have planes. You know, this company actually calls up Boeing and says, like, yeah, we need to order like 10 Dreamliners. That, I don't know. Like, how much do those planes cost? You know what I mean? And, and we're valued at more than them. Like, it just didn't add up. You know, like, yeah, we had some pretty crazy infrastructure going up and we had some pretty ambitious product uh, projects, but it just didn't really equate. Like, this is a, an established airline with like thousands of people flying every day. You know, and I was like, that's where for me, I was like, I don't know if this is going to end well. You know, like, and I, people are already talking about the bubble bursting and, you know, I still was kind of naive. I'm like, no, it's not like the tech bubble because tech, people were just like spouting ideas. There's nothing tangible. You know, people were just like trying to sell you an, an idea, on a concept. Whereas we still, we had facilities, there was lights there. You know what I mean? We could put plants there. Like we, we were making something tangible or something you could look at, feel, touch, smell unlike the tech. So I, I was kind of, I was wrong. We were all dead wrong. Cause man, when it wouldn't went down, it started crashing hard. It was like less than a year. And it just, yeah, I think I read somewhere, uh, investors in the Canadian market lost was close to $140 billion in cannabis or cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, rem- I remember when all that was, was getting hammered the, you guys were servicing demand. Right. I mean, you obviously you're expanding, you know, uh, you're building these facilities. You obviously had demand. Was most of that demand coming from out of the country? Because Canada, Canada only has, what, 37 million people? Yeah. What are we pushing, 40 or something like that? 40? Okay. Yeah. So there was overseas. You know, Germany was a, was a big medical market for us. Uh, Israel, and I don't know the numbers, so you have to, you have to forgive me on that. Uh, and that was definitely not, that was not my department or yeah. forte at all. Uh, so we, we were, I think we were servicing demand. Um, and some of the projections, like we were all built, it was this big run up to federal legalization where, you know, yeah, you got some good estimates of what the black market was, but no one really knew. You know what I mean? And I think it was super naive to think that we were just going to walk in and replace the black market. Like, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know how arrogant that is, but obviously way, way too arrogant. Um, I think at best it's 50-50 still. 50-50, 50% of the cannabis goes to Canada and then 50 is exported. No, sorry. Uh, black versus uh, oh, legal market. Black versus in Canada right yeah. now. Okay. So and I don't know why we thought, you know, and again, you're, 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 you're looking back, it all makes sense. When you're reading some sort of like, you know, stock analyst who's saying, throwing numbers out there. And he's like, well, is he, uh, do they want the stock to run up? Do they want the, and you keep making these gains? But, you know, some of the, some of the estimates for the demand, you know, it just made sense. Like, oh, well, there's going to be, you know, the, the, the mature Canadian market for demand for cannabis is going to be this. We're only here. We got to keep building facilities. We got to get bigger. We got to, you know, but we weren't the only company doing it. Everyone was doing it. Yeah. The businesses are run off a budget or pro forma. And when you break down a pro forma for a cannabis company, you take grams per square foot or, you know, square footage and break that into the price per pound and then put that into package flour consumables and you build this whole performa and the finance, you know, comes out with this whole projection of, all right, you're going to have 55,000 square feet. You're going to pull this down this much weight and this is how much the yield is and this is the market price. But there's, it's such a brand new market and it's so volatile that they don't take into consideration, you know, I guess they'd have a, a, a crop loss, you know, percentage built into the portfolio, I'd assume. But the market is so unpredictable. I mean, you can go from pounds being, you know, three, four thousand dollars one year to two thousand or fifteen hundred dollars the next to what three four hundred now? Yeah, exactly. So, you you can't building a performa based on a cannabis company that that that's so so new an industry that's so so new is is dangerous. Well, and there was such an oversupply, it became insane, and you know, it's crazy to see what's happening. I mean, some stuff large scale, like big amounts, like thousand kilogram batch lots are being sold. And the me wrong, this stuff is old. It's like, you know, three, four years old uh, for like seven cents a gram. 
It's crazy. Just going into just going into butane, right? Uh, I'm not. There's a. I've you know been hearing stories of a few extractors out there, fully licensed. You know, they're all above board and everything, but just grabbing the cheapest stuff they can, running it through, making some shatter, dumping on the market. No one knows any better. People are like, "Cool, it looks, looks all right. I'm gonna get buzzed, and it's cheap." So yeah. thankfully, we're starting to burn through all that old inventory. But there was a time, man, where. You know, one of the coolest things to come out of federal legalization, uh, and I hope that uh, you guys see this in the U.S. or maybe even this company moves into the U.S., but it's the uh, Canadian Cannabis Exchange. Super cool platform. Got a lot of respect for these guys. Came from oil and gas and uh, commodity trader, basically, right? And they just looked at cannabis as any other commodity. So it's an open platform where people, like, they just broker deals, right? Buy and sell. So you can look on this. You can log on and sort of see what, what's out there. And it's not just bulk flour. It's everything. It's everything that you could imagine from a, like a B2B Distillate, platform. extracts. Uh, finished product. Gummies, chocolate bars, pre-rolls, uh, equipment, services, new equipment, user equipment, everything. When I'd log on there, I was like, oh, no, this is not good. You would see, and they wouldn't, you would see like multiple, when I say multiple, I mean like five, six, seven, eight, you know, 100 kilogram or more batch lots of the same, same strain. Black cherry punch everywhere, you know, literal tons of the stuff available. And then it's just, you know, it, it's, it's not one of those things where if you build it, it will come. If you grow it, it will sell. So, and it, it just, it, it, there's such a glut on the market. It was insane. And then it's like, okay, cool. So we're getting five bucks a gram. No, four, three, two. And it's like just getting ground down, you know, you can get decent stuff for like 70, 60, 70, 80 cents a gram. Um, are you seeing a huge scale back in square footage? Massive. Massive. With Massive. these big producers. Yeah. So Aurora wasn't the only one. You know, Canopy, uh, which was, I, I, depending on what metric you use, they were, we it was always like the first and second place between Aurora and Canopy. You know, depending on how you look on it, Canopy is always bigger, Aurora is bigger, you know, whatever. They've scaled back considerably. Again, massive greenhouses being shut down. Canada also allowed uh, outdoor cultivation recently outdoor i mean your season's short up in canada oh, yeah right? yeah 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 but there's some regions that do it and they've been doing it well for a very very long time yeah um what i think is really unique about speaking to you and having you having you on is you got to see the extreme you got to see the extreme of large-scale cannabis cultivation you know big corporate company hundreds of thousands of square feet and now you're going now you you founded and started black route cannabis which you're going to more craft smaller cannabis cultivation how many um how many lights are you running at black rock so out of the micro which is just strictly for flour uh, we've got we got 120 120 lights 120 lights yes. how many employees what are we at? We're under 10. Under 10. So super, super craft. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, you know, the, the workings of that business um, and what services you guys offer? Extracts, clones, cuttings, flour, and how? Yeah. So when, when I was no longer with Aurora, uh, you know, like I say, right before the world ended, once I kind of tried to wrap my head around the looming apocalypse as best I could, um, it was really good to have some downtime, reconnect with the family. As you know, I got a young family, and it was great. Just like as 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 weird as it was, just to be at home, not to do anything. You know, I was on the road a lot, I was traveling a lot, uh, and and I was, I'm very grateful for the experiences that I had over the years. It was awesome. Wouldn't trade it for the world, but like just to like just get grounded again. You know, just sort of, just kind of like reacquaint myself with my family it was great. And it's funny in my mind, it feels like it was like you know months or years. Uh, I was doing some soul searching, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. My wife's like, no, it was like two months, you know, when I basically like had some downtime and then started BlackRock. And I was asking, like trying to think, like, what do I want to do? Like, I can pretty much do anything. Um, and I just couldn't shake the fact that it's like, I, I'm a grower through and through, always have been, you know, and just, it, it didn't make sense to not be in the industry, but how, you know, I didn't want to be a consultant. I didn't want to be ba bouncing back and forth to other people and just trying to figure out what I wanted. And at the end of the day, I just want to be selfish. And I wanted to bring the products that I like to market. So I'm a big, like, I love good flour, right? I love solventless extracts. 
You know, I'm not a really, I'm not a big concentrate guy, but if I do partake, I like rosin or I do love like a good old school black hash. And that's all we're doing. So I know that people, other people are like, oh, but hey, pre-rolls are a huge part of the market. I don't like pre-rolls because I don't buy them. I don't like them. You know what I mean? I like the whole ritual of like opening my little tin, grinding it up, looking at the flour. I like the process of rolling a joint or packing my vaporizer, right? Um, I get it. Just because other people want pre-rolls, I'm not going to be there to sell it to them because it's not what I believe in. Like for me, it's really important to believe what I, to, to bring to market what I want to see. Like I'm being selfish. And yeah, if other people want to buy a beverage or buy pre-rolls or buy, you know, some distillate, have at it, go for it. You know, you can get it from someone else. And because I don't want to be chasing, because what I find happens is just because today, you know, this product might take up 40% of the market or this product might have the best margins, that changes. You know, and one lesson I learned a very long time ago uh, in the legacy market was don't chase trends. Don't chase hype. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than going to, you know, my buddy, the wholesaler and being like, hey, check it out. Here's some great bubba. And, oh, man, I wish you had some of that PK because if you had PK right now, I could give you top dollar for it. But everyone's got bubba. So, you know, you can't just like pivot instantly, but turn around, get some cuts, get going, you know, next crop. Hey, I got some really, really good PK for you. Oh, it's too bad you don't have me that bubba. Because if you had some of that bubble you had before, I'd give you top dollar. And I'm like, yeah. you know what? Fuck it. At that point, I was like, <laughs> I'm not playing this game anymore. Like, yeah. I'm going to grow what I want, when I want, the way that I want to. And I'm not going to be apologetic for it. I'm just going to do what feels right to me. Right? And it's funny because you see you see it in the industry, all these people chasing the trends. And it's not to say that some of these some of these, the, these strains aren't good strains and whatnot. But it just, you've got to always have a handful of, of innovators. And, and the rest are all imitators. You know, and it's not a bad thing, but it's just kind of the way it is. And we'll talk about that later. I want to get on the we'll chat with you about more social media type stuff. But um, yeah, you, I always bug you about that. I'm like, yo, dude, you have an Instagram and you're like, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm still not. I mean, I do. I think I have like three people on it. It was just so I could, could uh, communicate with my tattoo guy. He was like, when I had a meeting. He was like, yeah, just send me a message on Instagram. I'm like, oh. Okay, I guess I have to have set that up. But it was like literally like zero posts, nothing. So why why don't you? I don't know, man. I got caught up um, with Facebook back in the day, and it was when we was kind of taken off. And one of the things that really bugged me was you know, you'd see something online where people would be like, "This is bullshit." Health Canada's you know putting a cap on on how potent you know strains can be. And I'm like, no, they're not. Like I know the regs, you know. So you try to be helpful and like just say, like, engage with people, like, actually, no, like, in this section of the regs, and I'd quote the regs, dude. I'd actually, like, post, you know, like, subsection whatever, here you go, copy and paste, right from the federal regulations. And people was like, no. I'm like, well, yeah. But and I just realized I was wasting, I remember the one time, distinctly, like, sitting at my kitchen table, a beautiful young family, eating dinner, and I'm sitting here just scrolling. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just like, this is dumb. Go to the, um, you know, the screen time function. And I'm like, what am I doing? You know, like if I, like I always complain I don't have enough time in a day to, you know, do something for myself, do something for my wife, do something for my kids, do something for a friend, take better care of myself. That's my time right there. Yeah. And I'm sorry. And just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not giving anyone a hard time for spending time on social media. I'm not that crotchety old man, you know, yelling to keep kids to stay off their lawn type thing. It's just, it's just not for me. I got to teach you how to post and ghost. Okay. <laughs> you, can't, you can't pay attention to the trolls. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's so, it's so weird it, that platform and people will say things on there that they'll never tell you in person or sh- straight face to face. And they'll just blast out with all kinds of stuff. Um, but if you were to approach them in person, be like, Hey man, like I saw this and you said this on the page and they're like, Oh, they'll backpedal. And, and it's, um, I think it's important for people on those platforms to remain conscious. And if they wouldn't communicate that way in front of you or to your face, they probably shouldn't be communicating that way in the DMS or on Mm -hmm. comments or, you know, it's, uh, it's hard, you know, you got to kind of have to learn to, to manage it. Well, and then the other thing that I found, and this is just, again, me personally, uh, it's not a reflection on anyone else, 
But when I took a step back and looked, I'm like, okay, what's happening here? Like when I, when I have a thought and then I, I, I put together a post or whatever, and again, this is back in the Facebook days and I, and I'd put out there what I, what I didn't like was if it was well received and people would, you know, you know, give me the thumbs up, they'd like it, they'd comment, they'd, they'd reshare it or repost or whatever the hell it's called. I can't remember, you know, it would really lift me up and I'd feel really good. But then it's not even so much the negative comments, but sometimes if I put something and I put some time and effort, when I say time and effort, I mean like three minutes, you know, something that deep. Yeah. And then I put out there and if it just sort of like, you know, Flops. people just, yeah. yeah. And then it would really, it would really kind of get me. And then I realized I'm like, this is really self-serving. This is actually really ego driven. And I just, for me, I just, I was like, I just, so I questioned that. I'm like, if it was to jump on Instagram, um, what am I trying to do? Like, what's my purpose? Like, do I actually have some information I want to share with people that is actually a value that people could, could maybe learn from and, and it would help them, you know, it, when it comes to cultivation or something like that, I'm not talking about like life shit. I'm just talking about like, you know, uh, sharing my experience is, could that be helpful to someone? And maybe, but I still worry that for me personally, it's still a little bit ego driven. hundred percent. And you got to be conscious of that because it can be, very ego driven. You're seeing it nonstop. I mean, I go on there and there's people that like, look at me look at my life. Look how great this is. Look. Um, and there's different things drive different people. And with us and why we're so, you know, we, we spend so much time on it. It's because of past experiences and knowledge that's getting dispersed out to the industry it's really important for that to be the right knowledge. Mm -hmm. And for us, why we, you know, spend so much time on content and creating knowledge posts is because we're always trying to help. We're trying to help create success and drive success for the cannabis cultivator because in the past, all the information that we've been fed about fertilizer or you know, how to, you know, cultivate or size pots or light or layout or this or that. A lot of it's, you know, not, not always, but a lot of the time it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. And so when we can go out there and cut through the bullshit and be like, look, we don't always know what's best, but this is what we know as of right now to be the best. And this is what works for us. And these are our true experiences. And then you share it very detailed in an SOP or a program that's been tested multiple times on different mini cultivars. And um, you share that with the community. And then you get, for, for me, I guess, you know, if you say that for, you know, if, if it means getting a DM from someone that's like, bro, like I follow your page, you changed my life. You know, I was, you, you know, I was able to, you know, support my family and, and, you know, do well with my cultivation because of the information I got from your page. That's self-serving because that, that obviously that, that's what drives me. Right. If mm -hmm. I get those messages, I'm just like, damn, dude, that's sick. You know, to be able to do that for somebody. Um, I think that's what, that's what drives our team. Well, and that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to even have the conversation with you is because there's very few people I'd even ask for advice when it comes to social media. And from what I've seen, uh, just being on the sidelines, look outside looking in, I like, I really, and this isn't lip service because I'm sitting here talking to you today. It, 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 I mean this sincerely. It, it's a little bit different. It's just, it's this sharing of knowledge and there's a little bit of like, it, it's almost humble, which I like the fact that it's like, it's constantly being updated. You know what I mean? So when you guys find something new or there, you know, you're not just like, nope, nope, that's not how it's done. You know, you, you say trust the program, but you're willing to admit that the program is evolving, right? Always. And because there's, we're always learning new things. You know, there's always someone trying something new, something different. I mean, dude, I'm sorry. Like some of the stuff before I actually put in place, I'm like, that's insane. There's no way I'm doing that. And I remember when you first like hit me up and you're, you know, okay, kept in touch over the years and hey what are you up to you know and you're like oh yeah i got like i'm on to something i'm like okay cool and you know i've always had a lot of respect for you you know really ambitious guy and whatnot and you've always done well with everything you've you've you know put your mind to you know so i didn't hold it against you but i really thought athena was just another nutrient company i thought you had you know you, you were smart enough to realize that if you get the 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 base ingredients at a good enough price you blend it yourself you have some cool packaging do a good branding thing you can compete with the other guys and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I wasn't going to hold you against it, but I really thought just like damn near every other nutrient, uh, you know, program I ever tried, 
that'd be the same thing where it's like, it works. It didn't kill my plants. I'm not mad at you. I don't want my money back, but it's not anything different, you know? And then I'm so grateful that you kept hounding me. Like, dude, let me send you a trial. Dude, come on. What, give me your address. Like, I don't even want anything from you. I'm sending you this. Just try it. Yeah. And I wasn't into it. I still pushed back. So at the time I was, I was organic. I'm like, no man, we're doing like, you know, hand watered organic soil. That's, I know the yields are lower. I know it's a bit more finicky, but right now it commands a better price point in the market. And it's something I believe in. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm really, really grateful that you kept pushing because I talked to my, my partner up in Edmonton at the, uh, at the micro dragon, uh, who's a very skilled grower, excellent cultivator. And he was like, I don't know, man. Like I've been kind of following these guys on Instagram and I think you should, I think we should, we should try it. I'm like, yeah, I think so. He's like, yeah, let's just run a little side by side. And dude, we didn't have, you know, like, uh, like a, a proportional injection system. Like he was just mixing up resis by hand and hand watering, you know, just in cocoa pots, like nowhere near even like the proper quote unquote, you know, system where we weren't running the program as we should. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, he was like, dude, what? He's like, w -w 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 there's something to this. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I can't really explain it. He's like, the plants are just happier. They're healthier. The stocks are twice the size there. He's like, I just, he's like, we should really look into some more. And, you know, that's all I needed from him. You know, I trust him implicitly. And so to have him, be, you know, give me that such great feedback, I'm like, okay. And it, again, like you say, it's, it's just that sharing of knowledge. It's just like, Hey, we're onto something different. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, back then because we had been we'd been boys a long time you know mm -hmm. i'd come up and see you we'd hang out you know here and there go out to the mj bizcon and hang out mm -hmm. when you're a cultivator and you've been growing weed for so long you know i started growing weed when i was like 16 and all the way up until i think I, we founded athena like five years ago and i'm 38 so when you've been growing weed so long and you've tried all these different fertilizers and you've, you've really fucked everything up really, to mm -hmm. be honest. I mean, I went, I used to grow veganically. I grew in big pots, small pots, soil, rock wool, cocoa. I've grown with straight perlite, DWC, undercurrent. And you try, I've tried, you know, canna was one of my favorite nutrients. I mean, canna was definitely, canna is a great fertilizer line. Um, but I've tried, you know, everything, um, heavy 16 GH botanic air Dutch master when they were in business, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty good line too. And then you work with like Chris Duran at UC Davis and you getting to the facts, right. And we're taking that and we're, you know, growing cannabis with it and we're seeing these results. And then I'm taking it to my greenhouse green and seeing results with it. You're like, holy shit, mm -hmm. I could do this with two bags and I'm crushing and growing the best weed. You're just like, I got, I'm calling you like, yo, bro, you got, <laughs> yo, hey, hey, you got to try this, Chris, you got to try this. And, um, well, I think one of the funniest things I remember right, right when I started, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm feeding how strong of an EC to unrooted clones. Like what is wrong with you? Like there's no way any other nutrient system, like anything I've ever done in the past would just fried them. You know what yeah. I mean? It was it wasn't so hot. And I did my typical, yeah, you know, I usually, yeah, after I take my cuts, you know, 14 days and they're good to transplant. And maybe some roots are popping in at like 10. Well, I let them, I didn't even look. Cause like, I've always been kind of like a, you know, like take, like take your cuts and just leave them like, you know, adjust the domes, whatever, but don't, don't mess them too much. Just leave them alone. And I waited to that like day 14 mark. And I was like, Oh, whoops. Like they, they were so tangled. And like, the, like, I don't even know, like, 24 inch roots off these cuts at like 14 days. It was, and I've showed you, I sent you the picture. I'm like, yeah. dude, what's going on? So now to know that I can pretty much transplant at day eight, you know, like just all these things are, I was like, I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it sounds, uh, anyone who ever listened to this and they're like, yeah, 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 I trust a program, whatever. It's just marketing or whatever. No, just do it. Like, cause I remember I asked you about yeah. flush. I'm like, so what do you think? Like flush for like, you know, cause I was worried. I'm like salts. I gotta, I gotta flush out that taste. I gotta get rid of that chemi taste that people don't like with hydro that people usually praise organics for. Right. I'm like, Hey, so how long am I flushing for? Like two, three weeks, you know? And like, no, two days. So I'm sorry. What? Yeah. Two days. I'm like, N no, like that's not going to work. You know what I mean? It's going to taste like crap. You know, it's just not going to be, it's not going to burn properly. Like people, I'm going to have like a rock hard, like a, basically a pencil, like a, like a graphite pencil on the end of my joint, you know? Um, no, nope, it works. So again, it's just like, and it's just, it, it it's kind of circled back for a sec. 
it's that sharing of information and just having the conversations. You know what I mean? And I think it's so refreshing to see uh, because people used to be so closely guarded. You know what I mean? They would like hoard their cuts. They wouldn't share the cuts. They wouldn't talk about what they're doing. It was like their secret recipe. It was their secret to success. You know what I mean? But everyone always learned from other people. You know, you gleam a little bit from that old school grower, from this guy, from that guy. Then people always would just sort of like hold it so close to their chest where it's like, no, I can't tell you. It's mine. But it was never yours to begin with because you got it from somewhere else bit by bit. Yeah. Maybe how you assemble it, you know what I mean? And kind of make it your own, but it's not, none of it's truly proprietary. Like, have we ever had, actually had an original thought? You know what I mean? Yeah. Probably not. No, it's all learned by trial and error. So the fact that you're out there just sharing that information, I mean, I was so dead set against Rockwell because I found it like, you know, 20 years ago, it was so finicky to me. It was too wet. It was too dry. I couldn't really get the drainage right. Like it was such a pain in the ass. There's no way I would do it. Now, it, like I felt so dumb the first time I tried, like the first time I set up a room, you know, picking up a box of Hugo's and I'm like, there's 64, you know, pots in here basically. And I'm picking up, we're carrying around like nothing and I'm not filling pots with dirt or with cocoa or, you know what I mean? Or like not hydrating bags. Oh, I felt so dumb. Like, how did I not figure this out earlier? You know what I mean? Look at my tables. They're clean. My lines are clean. Like it just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, all these little things. So, you know, again, like I'm very, very thankful that it's like it took that learning curve. And there's a few things along the way, you know, switching LEDs. I was like, oh, I don't look so happy. Not realizing that I need to, um, you know, raise my raise my room temperature. Like, yeah. right. Because that usually yeah, I was always happy to run my my temps lower if I could get my ACs to drop the temp lower running HPS. Because, you know, that air temperature was always so much lower than what your leaf surface temperature would be at the plant. Because yeah. that radiant that radiant heat, right. Well, I didn't even think about that. I mean, I can't touch an HPS bulb. Not at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can sit there and grab onto a, an LED. And then so realizing it's like, no, you got to raise your room temperature. Like, you know, drop your AC so that you can actually have like the higher temperature so plant can do what it needs to. You know, there's a few little learning curves along the way, but I can't believe, you know, since we started cultivating, uh, basically, I can't remember exactly when it was called this year, when I actually started popping seeds and getting the first... Um, uh, first pheno hunt going at the nursery, um, the learning curve has been so quick. Like, I feel like, you know, from what I've gleaned from this podcast, what I've gleaned from your facility advisors, just chatting with you, um, like literally like I'm years ahead. And that's not a, that's not like a joke. It's like the cultivation and like from the, from the nutrients and, and whatnot is it's not even, a, it's not really much of a concern anymore. I'm not fiddling around trying to dial it in. Like, you know, that used to be so much, that used to be such a big part of my day. Dialing in your fertilizer and your irrigation strategy and. Dude, my, my, my fertigate or my irrigation is set. You know what I mean? I got my, my frequency, my duration set up with like the simplest system. And then like, that's actually, you know, we talked about this a while ago and I think, I think you've had some, some really cool people on, on here. Um, but I just want, if there's any of the smaller growers listening, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, hobby growers or even like a bit small craft, don't think that like Athena is only for the big guys. It's not only for scale. Uh, it's not only, you know, Demeter, you know, with these incredible, incredible systems that you guys are setting up. It's actually way more affordable and way more accessible than it's ever been. I mean, you talk to most people that are growing at scale and they're literally dropping a hundred grand, if not more into automation per room, Right. Then when I was talking with Sean at Demeter, he's like, no, 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 we'll get you set up on this, 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 you know, it's an app on your phone, open sprinkler. Like, I'm like, well, how much? He's like, oh, it's, I can't remember the exact amount, but I was like, shocked. A few hundred bucks. A few hundred bucks, dude, yeah. compared to, and I'm not knocking Argus, right? There's always a place for that type of stuff, but um, literally hundred thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars down to a few hundred. Yeah. Come on. That's what I think with, uh, you know, we set up at Demeter Designs, we set up a small scale room irrigation layout for the small guys. But I think a lot of guys look at Demeter Designs and they're like, I got a 20 light grow. That, that They're way over my head. That's for like big facilities. But the thing is, it's not. No. Because it'll change your 20 light grow. It'll put completely automate your 20 light grow if you wanted it to. Without a doubt. Um, yeah. It was the best thing I did. So we knew we were going to go that route for the micro, which is 120 lights. But my nursery, which is is super small, just kind of what I, uh, what I uh, work on along with a, a really really skilled grower uh, takes care of the day-to-day for, for me. 
what do we got in there? Uh, six, eight, 14 lights. And you use Demeter Designs to yeah. light up. Yeah, absolutely. It's huge. Are you using Dosatron on the 14 lighter or yeah, are you using Dosatron? Dosatron on a 14 lighter. Yeah. So when I was, when I was chatting with Drag and um, my partner up in Edmonton, you know, it just made sense. Cause like literally we built the facilities, their, their new builds. So we kept everything the same. The yeah. flooring was the same. The HVAC was the same. Uh, the, if, if I'm going to be trialing things on a small scale, you know, for my, the perpetual kind of, you know, hunt I'm doing, uh, at the nursery, it's gotta be as replicatable as possible on the big scale. When I say big scale, it still is bigger, right? But, um, same lights, same, every, we kept everything the same. So it only made sense. But even for me, I was having a tough time, you know, with the cost. And when we actually broke it down, it just made sense. You know, it wasn't that much, you know, yeah. cause I just assumed it was going to be, it wasn't going to make sense. And. And, but yeah, actually, you know, Kyle or is it Grand? Grand Jettos. Grand Jettos, man. I don't know if that guy gets enough credit, but I can't get over like the service and pricing there, you know? So he's one of the best. So we got the quote because, you know, so we, you, you, so anyone who's not familiar with the meter, you know, if I can just kind of share my experience, yeah. reach out, chat with Sean, it works out great. Um, super quick. You get your, your layout and you're like, okay, hey, cool. What do I do with it now? looks awesome. I have these awesome PDF, you know, it's like the, the world's coolest Lego system. You know what I mean? It's like the best. You Lego got kit. your uh, parts list, everything yep. you need, every single, you know, elbow 90 pump, you know, net of him dripper, your whole parts list is ready to go. Yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. What do I do with it now? And they're like, oh yeah, talk to Kyle. I'm like, mm, okay. And don't be wrong. I thought, yeah, of course, you know, it makes sense. You're going to be passing business on to you know, a buddy or somebody you've done work with. But you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, we're based in Canada. We got freight. There might be some some duties or customs. Uh, there's exchange rate. There's all these different things to consider. So you know, maybe we should look into it. And I bet you, my buddy probably burnt up damn near three weeks pricing things out. And he was like, "All right, here's the thing. I can save twenty bucks on this pump here, but they only have that pump." And then I got to get these fittings from here, but I can't find this pipe here. He's like, "I'm gonna have to order from like twelve different places, and we're paying more money." And I'm like, oh, okay, so you're saying it's a good price? He's like, dude, I don't know how they're doing it, but like, just, yeah, he's like, place the order. And of course, when it's a cross border and, you know, it's a new vendor, I'm always a little bit iffy, right? Because, you know, we want to kind of keep things moving. And just a true pleasure to deal with in the sense that there was no BS with the price. It was like, oh, sorry, it's out of stock, but hey, I can get this, but it's only 20% more. Or, you know, you're seeing it a lot of times now with anything in construction, Oh yeah, that was a price last week. The price this week has gone up. Yeah. You know, no, the price was honored. Uh, yeah, I'll have it on a truck for you tomorrow. Okay, here you go. Like, and I was just like, I was stunned. Like, so yeah, could not be happier with the like our experience from with Demeter and Grand Jettos. Like, it was so Grand. The reason why we send all of our business or Demeter sends all of its business to Grand Jettos is exactly what you just said. You know, the pricing, the service, the availability, and the consistency. But Nobody, you don't realize Grand Jettos has been in business for over 30 years. I mm. think possibly even longer, you know, than that. They have relationships that they've built over that time with Netafim, you know, Spears, um, Grunfoss, all these these major companies because they're more of an, a large ag distributor. They're not like the regular, you know, hydro shop that doesn't understand sometimes, not always, but understands what, what, what Grunfost is or mm. what pump, you know, to use or what, what's the best PVC, you know, or, and that's, that's where Grand Jettos comes in and their, their experience and all that and can get, you know, everything you need and, and for the right price because of the relationships and how long they've been in business. It's, it's a big deal. You know, Kyle's the man. Yeah. Nothing but a good thing to say. So yeah, anyone uh, who is even remotely considering, if everyone's like listening, they're like, oh, I've been thinking about, you know, send, uh, reaching out to Demeter. You know, but I don't know if it's really worth or not. Like I'm telling you, just do it. Yeah. It'll be the be one of the best things you've ever done. It is. It looks daunting at first. Even when I was trying to wrap my head around. I mean, it's not that dosatrons are are inherently complex. You know, they're not. But the system as a whole. When I was first looking at like the design, I'm like, okay, what goes where? But as soon as you wrap your head around it, and it's a very very short learning curve. It's it, 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 it's so simple. It's just and it just works. I think I when I linked you up with the meter. I was like, hey, call my boy Sean. Just trust me. It'll change your life. Like, your life will be changed. Just just work with Sean. Like, this is, and then uh, it's cool to to come full circle and, and hear your experiences. And that's sick. It's I really been, appreciate that. 
Well, and, and, you know, when you, when you look at like certain challenges and stuff like that, you know, earlier you asked me, you know, what were some of the challenges that you faced, you know, at Aurora, you know, scaling up, um, a lot of the stuff I had to deal with, I mean, and, and granted the scale is, is a lot smaller. I mean, we're big now I'm back to small or smaller, uh, but we're not having those issues. You know, we're just not having issues with, with the irrigation system. You know, it, it, it just, it's been so, it's just so nice and simple that it just works. There's less moving parts, there's less things to go wrong, less things to monitor, to try to figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, then the nutrient system is, cl- like the nutrient line is clean and it just works and the plants are happy. And I, mean, I, I just, I, it was almost that time that he was, I, I, I'm still, like at the beginning, I was still, and still this day sometimes I'm like, this is almost too good to be true. Like, how is this just like humming along so good? And how does it allow me to focus on other areas of business I need to focus on, you know? And, and it's great because it's like when you have that pressure taken off your shoulders, which used to chew up so much of my time, so much of my time, um, you know, it allows me to like sort of look elsewhere. It's like, you know, you've always got the, the, the most, the biggest, most urgent fire to put out any one time, right? Uh, and we're ramping up to actually get sales into different provinces and dealing with, you know, completely insane, you know, tax structure that the federal government has set up, um, you know, it's frustrating. It's hard to get products to market, but but at least I have that bandwidth. At least I have that ability to work on that. You know, as opposed to sometimes it, you have to like focus on one area of uh, one area at the expense of another, right? So I really believe right now that if I was focusing on the on what I had to right now, I wouldn't have time to chat with my team to try to tra- problem solve these issues that would have inevitably come up with other systems and other nutrients. And we're just not seeing it. So it's just, it's, it's such a relief and yeah, it, it actually does free up a lot of time. And I actually, uh, kind of, I don't know if it's so much that I feel bad for them, but the people I'm working with are such skilled, such wonderful people, but I don't know if they know how good they have it. Like, no, <laughs> no they don't. And I'm joking. Of course they do. They've, they, you know, it's not like they just, they've, they've got their own experience, uh, with, with growing and cultivating and whatnot. So it's not to say that, you know, they haven't run into these issues in the past, but especially going to scale where it's just like, I know there's still a lot of headaches. I know there's a lot of long hours. I know there's a lot of literal blood, sweat and tears being put into this. Um, but just be grateful that you're not dealing with biofilm in your lines. You know what I mean? Um, or pH flux in your, in your rock wall. And that, that's, mm-hmm. that's why you're able to run rock wall is because that's why we're so strict on trust the program. It's, you can't, if you ever, sometimes you'll hear people say like, I start to take things away and it seems like things get better. Well, that's, 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 those are facts. You know, it's because a lot of the things that you're adding to your root zone are causing you way more problems than benefits. And uh, most of it is, is pH flux, especially in Rockwell. Rockwell is a very sensitive media to run, you know, you can get away with things in cocoa or soil, but you go to rock wool and you put, you know, some kind of organic matter in that root zone, you're going to get mad pH flux and you're going to be all over the place thinking you have a deficiency, but when you really don't, you just have a pH problem. Um, so it's, it's really important. And that's why we're, because when we first started marketing to the industry and doing Athena, we were fighting a lot of, uh, misinformation when it came to like, what to put in the root zone. And we were learning a lot of stuff ourselves as well. And we always thought, you know, you needed glucose or sweeteners or, you know, different uh, powdered molasses or molasses in general and, and all this stuff. And, you know, we were, the more we removed and the more we worked with Chris Duran at UC Davis, the more we learned that we're actually doing way better without any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause the plant doesn't know the difference, you know, so it's um, it's really cool to 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 hear your experience um, with that and, and to meet her. It's one big. one thing I'm really excited because uh, you know we we do we're always a little. It's funny, Canada's a little bit ahead of you guys in some regards, but we're always a little behind in terms of product availability. So one of the things uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, is swapping out core to fade. Yeah. Have you, you haven't, you haven't, we haven't, no, it's only available like this month. Like, so it's actually like this week, I think it's available. In oh, they're, they're shipping it. Yeah. You should have hit me up. I would have just shipped you some. Yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm excited. So, and cause and run me, if you can run me through that. So you, you want to drop nitrogen, yeah. but not at the expense of, cause if we Calcium. ran back, okay. And that's where you can start getting things like fungal, you know, bud rot and whatnot, correct? Towards the end of a flower, if you pull it back too much. 
Yeah, you know, we get it a lot. Guys are on this, what you just said earlier, they're on this, you know, two week flush mm. and they, they need a flush for two weeks to, to have a good, clean, white ash smoke, good taste and bring out the taste of the plant. What they're trying to do really essentially is pull the nitrogen out of the plant. And they think it's, I think in the past they, they, they believed it was just all fertilizer, pull all fertilizer out. But really what they're trying to do is just pull nitrogen. Nitrogen is going to take away from the, the aroma, the taste, the, the, the terpene output, the T, even the THC output. Hmm. Um, so when you remove that nitrogen, you're allowing the plant to, be, to get to its real genetic potential, like what it's really supposed to be. Okay. Um, so I think this, this past where, you know, I, I'd get a phone call and they're like, hey, I'm getting mad bud rot on Athena. You know, my nugs got way too big and um, I'm getting really bad bud rot. And I'm like, okay, uh, how long are you flushing? First question, right? Always. And they're like, oh, two weeks. And you're like, okay, well, flush for, you know, 36 hours. And they're just like, no way, this, that. And just like you, mm-hmm. right? you know, fighting it. It's really what they were doing is they're growing these large, you know, large buds and colas. And then they're pulling all the calcium out of the plant, which affects the, the tissue of the plant. It, it, it's involved in the cell walls, correct? Yeah, yeah. the cell walls and allowing for botrytis and, 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 uh, and, and pathogens to kind of take over the tissue of the plant, which is giving you bud rot. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what Fade does is bloom, our bloom formula has zero nitrogen in it. Okay. So core has all the nitrogen. And so when you take core out, replace it with fade, it's the only fertilizer line that completely eliminates nitrogen. So there's zero nitrogen at all. Um, and as the last three weeks, you're still, you still have some nitrogen, but it's slowly being used by the plant. And then it gets, when you're, when you're finishing, it gets to what the plant's really supposed to be. And that's why some guys are seeing like, you know, a little bit more fade, purple, Mm -hmm. um, some, some genetics just kind of light now and turn a little bit more like a a, a amber yellow. Um, but some just turn like super purple and, and black even. I gotta say, I've seen some really, you know, without even using fade, but just Athena in general, uh, way more colors in some of these cultivars than I've ever seen. You know, we're talking like, like burgundy stems and stuff like stock and stem. Like, cool. Never seen that before. Now, in all fairness, I've never run that strain before, but like it's a, it's like a kaleidoscope in these rooms, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, because we're, we're, we're doing things a little bit differently. We're, um, instead of finding a handful of, of strains that, we, you know, we really like and dialing it in and really kind of perfecting uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, mainly just my own selfishness, uh, we're doing three strains per room. I got three tables and each, each table gets a strain. And then that's it. Once we run it, it's done. Limited release. You said that to me on the phone the other day. And I was like, but what if you find something that's just like a winner? Like it's dead. You killed it. Mm-hmm. But there's so much out there. Like the the genetic library is seeds that I'm saying right now. It's going to take more than two years to go through right now. Right. And like the, uh, you know, I know people like to bash some of these breeders and just call them chuckers or whatever, but chuck away. Like some of the, some of these crosses that we're getting right now, I've never seen such a, a awesome diversity in, in the strains that are available and they're solid, you know, and not only that with, with, uh, with the nutrients, with the lighting, with, with, get, you know, even some sort of like older kind of tired, more strains that shouldn't really hold their place in the market right now, you know, some of the late nineties stuff that I'm really looking forward to bringing back. They're unreal. You know what I mean? It's like they're being brought back to life because they're not being grown That's cool. under, you know, metal halide and then, you know, shitty HPS, you know, not even like a good double ended, but like the old school HPS, you know, yeah. that like the spectrum was all over the place. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, and, and, and the reason for that is just like, the t- I really want that variety, right? Because I don't know if you find this, but even if you have that winner, you know, I, I try to always look back again, like m- not more as like, don't forget what it's like to be as a, as a consumer, you know, yes, we're cultivators at heart, but I'm also a consumer. So I still make sure that I go into the retailers and I still buy other people's product, you know, just to see what's out there and, you know, to you know see what I like, what I don't like, see what kind of trends are out there and whatnot. 
And what I found is, yeah, there's there's some that really I'm really impressed with. A couple strains, right? And so when I walk in, I'm like, hey, do you have you know do you have platinum grapes? Uh, no. Then I go to another another store another t- day. Do you have platinum grapes? Yes, I'll grab it. Right, but that only lasts for a few months because then after a while, even if it's still kind of like scarce and not always available, it, it kind of I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I've had that before. You know what I mean? Like, and I I, I think cannabis consumers like. I think it's pretty rare that you have that one go-to strain that you always, always go back to. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you might kind of reminisce like, hey, remember that one sour diesel you had? Like all that, I love that. That was so good. But it's not like my uh, like I miss it that much. Like my life is missing something. You know, it's like, it's that constant, like something new, something different. Like it's still within like, well, like gassy strains sometimes, or sometimes like a really fruity strain, you know, something really skunky, but it doesn't need to be that specific strain. And I mean, f- first of all, I've always had issues. I'll be honest. My one of my biggest downfalls as a grower uh, is long term, uh, st- like like keeping mums for a long time. I find after a year they just get tired and old, and they just don't they just don't perform the same well uh, way. Even if I take co- uh, clones and try to like you know regenerate them or whatever, like you know start a new round of mums, it just I don't know. Over time, I've just and you know maybe I'm doing something wrong or I could do something different. Uh, I just realized that's one of my biggest weaknesses as a grower is keeping mums and keeping them happy and healthy. Like I do notice no matter how hard I try, it starts out great. And then crop after crop, you know, it's, it's slow after time, but then it just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that we don't know about the cannabis plant. And I was talking to Bruce Bugby yesterday. I had a conference call with him and Chris Durand, um, you know, the Athena and Utah State and Bruce Bugby were partnering for 2023 on on uh, plant nutrition research, and one of the things um, that we talked about was uh, hoplite and viroid. Mm-hmm. And I was was talking to Bruce and I was telling him, hey, you know, at the Jungle Boys, Mike Hydro runs 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 the tissue culture lab, and he has been for about five years. And he's re he's rejuvenating the genetics and kind of Bruce kind of corrected me. He was like, I don't know if you're rejuvenating the DNA of the plant. I don't think you'd be rejuvenating anything. And I'm like, well, well, this is what we're seeing, right? We're, they're seeing that they take a, a genetic that's been on the streets for seven, 10 years in the black market, getting run down by everybody. Mm-hmm. And they're taking that, that cultivar, that genetic and they're bringing it into the Jungle Boy Tissue Culture Lab, and they're doing you know three or four multiple runs of Meristem Tissue Culture, and they're seeing that the plant is growing better. So I'm automatically saying that they're rejuvenating the genetics. And Bruce came back and he was like, there's a lot of other viruses and things that we don't know about mm. that could be in the plant. So when you're saying that you're rejuvenating the genetics, well, you're bringing the genetic back to its original state by getting rid of the viruses that we're not testing for, because there could be a virus in the plant that's not called, not called hoplite and viroid. It's not called HLV, but it's some other virus that we don't know about that's slightly affecting the plant in Mm -hmm. a certain way. And it can't be a, uh, a big, you know, like hoplite and viroid, you look at it and it's, you know, the leaves are stuck together. The, the, the 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 branches are going more sideways. You could push down on a branch and it kind of breaks off. And it just the, the plant's weak. And mm-hmm. when you when you you really see it when you start to flower the plant. But there's other. He was he was telling me that there's other viruses that that could be in the plant that just don't affect it that way. That that affect just kind of it slightly. And we're, it's just st- stuff we don't know about. And it's really cool to hear that. And when you're saying you know, you're throwing your genetics away. For me as a cultivator, there's been multiple times where I pop some beans, you know, I do a run either in a greenhouse, outdoor or indoor, and I get a fire cut and I'm just like, look at this plant. It's like perfect color, you know, structure. It's not receptible to PM. It's looking amazing. But then I lost it. Mm -hmm. It's gone, you know? And I'm like, fuck. Like, so what do you, I mean, do you ever get that? I mean, do you, yes yet? and no. Um, then I'd have to ask you though, at what cost, you know, a greenhouse dedicated to mums, you know, that you're just trying to, and then eventually they get tired and old, you know, even if it's not so much about uh, different viruses, 
you know, of course, I think that could have an issue. Uh, I think just the impact of life, you know what I mean? The longer that you're, whether you're a plant or a human or anything in between, the more time you spend on this planet, you know, life affects you. You know, uh, maybe on a genetic level, maybe on a cellular level, I don't know. But every time something happens, and, and I've seen it, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, potentially pest, uh, environmental stress, you know, the plant adapts, you know. So when you first pop a seed, I love cloning off of that first initial seed. That initial seed vigor to me is just like they're the strongest, they're just the most youthful, vigorous, you know, they're just ready to go. And I think what happens, and again, this is just my, I, there's no science behind this. this, is just, you know, based on what I've seen, it's a theory at best, I guess, is that the longer that they go, you know, life happens. You'll have that that heat spike because, you know, the ACs go or, you know, you, you, you screw up your light. Like things happen. You know what I mean? And I think the plant adapts. You know, sometimes it's not a big deal. It's just one little adaptation. You know, they adapt to their environment. They adapt to that stressor, whether it's a virus or, you know, temperature, humidity, pest, whatever. Um, and then it might not kill it. You know, I mean, sometimes it actually might, you know, a certain amount of stress, you know, like I'm a big fan of like, you know, uh, LST, like light, light stress training. Um, I find like that little bit of stress really gets the plant to respond the way that I want it to. Yeah. So I think some stressors are actually really good to get us to help bring the plant out the way we want it to. But we don't know all these little intricate little things, right? You know, what happens if your pH in the root zone goes too high? What happens if they get root bound? What happens if they dry out with too much of a dry back? I mean, it, it, there's an infinite amount of possibilities that could happen to a plant. And over time, I think they do start to add up. You know, we got uh, tissue culture kits coming in. I'm going to send you one for free because I got to get you. I, I can't I can't have you just be throwing away a bunch of genetics when you could just take a cut of it. And then, you know, you could have your book of moms. I, mean, I think that's that's the biggest thing is why we did this tissue culture kit is 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 two main reasons. OK, one is to manage a book of genetics without mm -hmm. exactly what you just said. You have this big greenhouse full of moms of genetics. You could literally have that in a shelf in a closet. Yeah. And kudos to you guys again, you know, for, for just knocking on the park. I don't think people really, truly realize how huge that is and how big it's going to be. Because I saw firsthand, uh, again, you know, when, when you mentioned tissue culture, I'm like, yeah, yeah okay, whatever. Been, th <laughs> been there, done that, seen it. Because yeah. even though I wasn't involved directly with it, you know, in the earlier days of Aurora at, at that first facility, you know, it, the tissue culture, the, it was a bit of a buzzword, right? People were trying to get that developed. And it's not to say that tissue culture wasn't, didn't have really good uh, success and wasn't, didn't have its applications in other areas of, of agriculture, but I saw really, really smart people, way smarter than me, you know, PhD level guys, multiple, uh, putting their heads together, trying to make this work and they couldn't. And that's not a dig at them. These are great people and they were well-funded. Like, I don't know what the full tab of, of that tissue culture program would have been, but I know it wasn't cheap. Like, and they couldn't get it figured out, you know, or like sometimes they get it true, but I'm like, okay, cool. You've got this little weird green mass that looks like it's free of, of some sort of contaminants. What do you do with it now? And then I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm like, well, how do we bring that to market? Like, what do we do? Like, I know if I pop a seed, I take a mom, I take a cut. I know how to manage that. What do I do with this? And I don't think anyone really quite knew what to do. And the biggest thing I heard, and again, I wasn't involved day to day directly with it, but when I'd, you know, kind of, you know, shoot the shit with people and say like, how's it going? I kept hearing time and time again that it was the media, just trying to figure out the media. Yeah, well, we're trying new media. And I, I you know, to have Jungle Boys be so open with, with information, you know, from the lighting, from the nutrients to now tissue culture media, like you guys made it, it's harder to make Kool-Aid, Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I literally have to add sugar and water. This is just like, I just open the pack and like you, you've made it that simple. Yeah. But that's, that's huge. It's huge. I don't know if people really quite, again, this is like going back to my comment earlier about, you know, sometimes people don't realize how good they have it. Um, you know, I guess we're all guilty of that to, to, to some extent, you know, you don't realize what it was like before these advances came and you just, you can almost take it for granted. And that doesn't make you a bad person. You just don't have that frame of reference to realize, you know, how hard it was, like what kind, how much time went into developing that. I mean, I actually personally don't know, but I have, I have, I have a good idea that that was not an easy feat to actually like have that success. And then just so, to so freely share it. It is just, it's awesome. The, um, there's, uh, 
one of our guys in the tech team, a newer grower, he's been growing for two years, and um, younger kid, you know, super, super good guy. I met him at the dirt bike shop and he worked the parts counter and he was like, oh my, you know, you guys are with Lux, you guys were with Athena. And um, we just became friends and, and I hired him and he's got, he runs a little eight lighter and he was using some other, you know, fertilizer before and um, started running Athena and got him on the program and He's just like, dude, I'm killing it. I took down this much weight, did this. I'm, I always tell him, like, dude, you have no idea how good you have it. <laughs> it's like the shit that we had to go through to get to this point. I mean, you just fast tracked, you know. Well, and parking, I don't know if it was like like this here, but like parking a block and a half away from the hydro store. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you're like, you know, like not necessarily worried about cops, but worried about someone else following you, you know, to get ripped off. You know, like it was yeah times have changed a lot you know and then like kind of the nudge nudge wink wink like uh i'm growing some tomatoes and i have these bugs and i need to do something about them it's like yeah unmarked bottle gets slid across the table like 10 mils per gallon wear a mask <laughs> you know yeah 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 was there anything anything else we were missing or wanted to talk, no, talk to about i think you know re- regarding you know the it sounds like black rock cannabis, you're going to always have new genetics consistently. Yeah. That's, that's the goal, right? Absolutely. Um, that's where I think instead of throwing them away, just throw them in a bank, tissue culture bank. Without a doubt. Yeah. Just, just cause if you find that one that just hit her, you know, checks all the boxes, grows right right THC numbers, the taste, um, you're going to want to have it back. I think it'll be nice to bring it back too, you know, especially if yeah. it is a bit of a fan favorite, you know, or again, selfishly for me, if I'm like, oh, I really like that orange ice pop. I want to I bring that back. That was good. Yeah. Let's bring that one back. Uh, it could be fun to do a re-release for sure. The first thing I did when we finished the tissue culture lab, I have a <clears throat> facility in Nevada and um, I packaged up one of the prototypes Mm-hmm. It was kind of, it's kind of janky, but Hey, it works. Right. Um, and sh- shipped it out there with some media and I was like, guys, start, start, do it all, get to work. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of people think that they need to build a whole lab and it needs to be all complex and mm-hmm. very complicated. Uh, they're doing it in the hallway. They're doing t- tissue culture on a Rubbermaid bench in the hallway of the facility, uh, next to a baker's rack. And just right then and there, just cutting while people are walking by and doing TC right there in the hallway. I can't wait to get started. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's, that's what the team not, you know, the team's really good at here is simplifying things, Mm -hmm. not making it too complicated and, and making, making it simple because it doesn't have to be that complicated. Just like, you know, with the when Arroyo Arroyo was trying to do a tissue culture lab at their facility, trying to figure out the the media is it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And fortunately we have Mike on the team, which has been working on his, his formulation of media for 10 years, um, strictly for the cannabis plant. Mm Because each media with tissue culture, if you're doing date palms or, you know, grapes, the media is different. Mm -hmm. You can't have the same media. So having, and I can understand why Arroyo back then was having a problem with the media because nobody was doing tissue culture on the cannabis plant back then. So I'm sure they had formulations for other plants that they're trying to use on the cannabis plant. But fortunately for us, we had, you know, Mike Hydro, which has been doing, cannabis tissue culture for almost 10 years and he had the formulation for the cannabis plant which ivan has pretty much given to the entire Mm -hmm. you know world now um for them to use so cuts through a lot of bs yeah which again is so cool to see you know nothing but respect for that no thanks with um with black rock cannabis and that business model you were saying that you were able to ship to different providences in Canada. Mm-hmm. Is there any limitations on that license or do you have to get another license to be able to do that? So it depends uh, on what kind of, what, what class of license you have. So with, uh, with, well, we could go down a rabbit hole here. Uh, 
I'm going to, sim- in, the, in the interest of keeping things simple, like we just talked about, and uh, not complicating things, uh, there are limitations on your license. You can either get a different type of license or get different types of amendments to your license. But depending on what you want to do, what products you want to sell and where, uh, you can get a different license. Now, it allows you, the federal the license is federal for production and sale and whatnot, but the distribution and retail is handled by each province and territory. And there is, oh geez, I hope I say this right, there's 13 provinces and territory. I'm going to feel like an idiot if that's not true. I should know my Canadian geography, so I hope I got that right. So you... To be able to sell and distribute in each province, you need to have a separate license. No, no, you can. Uh, so, if you need a separate license to sell to any of those provinces and, 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 and distributors, sorry, a province and, and territory, but each province and territory has a different way of doing things, okay. which makes it, you know, so much fun. Yeah, okay. not at all. Yeah. So, okay. you know, it's interesting, and and I would be surprised if um, that's not what we see in federal, like you know, in the U.S. If and when it goes federal, whether it's for medical or rec or both. I would imagine that's what it's going to look like. Some sort of federal licensing or some sort of just ability to not get in trouble on a federal level, right? How large, how many is, I heard, is it 2,000 square feet you're allowed to cultivate in? It works out to be, they do it in, we're Canadian, so we do it in square meters, but I think it works out to roughly, was that 2,200 square feet of canopy space. Okay. So that's why, and that's underneath the uh, micro cultivation license. So what that allows is a, kind of like a craft, you know, brewing license or you know, craft brewery. Uh, they just wanted to kind of reduce some of the barriers to entry for smaller producers, and uh, it's helped. Um, it, it is a little bit easier than it would be to start than starting like a, a big company like we did with Aurora. There's a lot more, a lot more cash uh, up front, especially for when it comes to things like security and uh, facility design. So they do make it a little bit easier. Still a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of red tape, uh, and, and a lot of cost. But it is it is uh, it is easier to a certain extent. But what they did is instead of saying you're only allowed so many plants or you're only allowed so much production, they just limited canopy space, which in my opinion is probably the most fair way of doing it. You know, uh, that way you can manage your canopy the way you, you best see fit. You're not limited to plant count uh, and you're not ever at risk of destroying excess product, right? That's the right way to do it for sure. I think so. Square foot of canopy. Yep. It, it makes it, it simplifies the whole process. Yeah. Are you still as heavily regulated on quarantining and, and doing that whole thing as these bigger ones? Yes and no. And and what I mean by that is yes, in the sense there's still an expectation from Health Canada that you're going to take certain things into consideration. Like uh, what are your cleaning protocols? They're, they want to know like what are your SOPs? And you need to have, uh, have, at a very bare minimum, certain SOPs that cover things like site security, uh, you know, cleaning, sanitization, uh, certain procedures. Like, you know, if you're going to ship cannabis from one site to another site or to a distributor, like how do you record that information? They, they do make it that there's certain information you do have to record and keep on in storage for a certain amount of time. But how you do it, as long as you meet those, re- those regulatory requirements, how you do it's kind of up to you. And I've seen it time and time again where people overshoot it by like, you know, tenfold, hundredfold, where they don't know. And and I think, again, a lot of the consultants come from a sort of a pharma background or, you know, regulatory kind of compliance background where that's what they've seen in other industries. They're not wrong. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not telling you to do something uh, that it might not be appropriate, but it's something I, I think a lot of it's not necessary. It might not be a requ- it be required. Um. So the craft, the craft uh, license is still pretty heavily regulated, just not as much as the large scale. Yeah, it, there's still definitely a lot of requirements. You know, you gotta. There's some fees involved, but you know, to give you an example, the, I think the yearly fee for a craft license or like a micro license is twenty five hundred compared to twenty five thousand. So, gotcha. uh, but you still need to get your security clearance, uh, certain or sorry, certain key personnel. Uh, they they still treat you the same, more or less the same way. It just. Um, little less like for example you don't need to have uh you don't need to have security cameras it's not a bad idea to have them but you don't need to whereas if you're a full uh full size pr- uh, pr- a producer or a processor you, there are requirements for cameras and they need certain coverage and uh, certain door access control and whatnot um, so some things again there's still not a bad idea to have you know from just even like a corporate security you know you, you know if you're going to build this facility how do you want to protect it yeah. right 
can you own multiple 2,200 square foot licenses in the same Providence or is just limited to one? You can have as many as you want. Now, with that said, at some point, and, and it's interesting you say that because I think that's where a lot of people, like the kind of light, the proverbial light goes on in their head where they're like, wait a minute. If this is a lower barrier, like lower cost entry, lower barrier to entry, why don't I just run multiple micros? And I don't know what that number would be, you know, whether it's two, whether it's three, whether it's four. At some point, you're better off just having one, you know, especially, I mean, maybe there is something we said about having different micros, you know, spread across the country or spread across the province or even in the same area, uh, maybe in the same, um, like, you know, commercial, you know, industrial park type thing. Maybe there's something you said about that. Uh, that's how you could maybe maintain those smaller rooms, small canopy size, really maintain that quality. Especially, it's funny, actually, I was just having this chat with uh, with Jamie, like the guy who runs the nursery for me, and he was saying, I think that's the way that you could maintain that quality on scale, is that if you just had everything totally independent, you know, so just you'd only have that team work on that same size. You know, you'd lose some efficiencies of scale for sure, but that's the only way you could replicate that quality, craft quality on a large scale. And when, and I'm being super, when I say that, I mean, I'm being super, super picky, you know, hand, uh, hand trimmed, hang dried, you know, real, real attention to detail when it comes to default and whatnot. Uh, when it comes to plant training, uh, you know, real hands-on approach, you know, the guy, the, the team, they spend a lot of time and, and it shows in my opinion, I think that quality shows, you know, as soon as you get an automated trimmer, and I know people are argue and say, no, there's a good wet trimmer. No, there's a good dry trimmer. There's a good way. I, and I'm not saying they don't do a good job, but you, it, 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 they look different. Yeah. It's, it's substantial. You get the round nuggets, um, when it goes through any, any machine trim period. You can, and then not only that, you just see, you don't need any spent, any sort of special equipment. Just look at your phone. You know what I mean? Like take your phone, put on the magnifying you know, function and look, and you can see the heads are gone. Not all of them, but they're gone. This still looks frosty. It's still good. It's still decent. Uh, and again, I'm being super picky. But if you're going to sell something as a as a as a ultra pre or as a premium product, I think it should be a premium product. Not to say there's not a a, a place for the large scale uh, production. Not everyone wants that. I'm going after a very 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 small uh, segment of the market, right? Uh, I get it. It's not for everyone. You know, some people want cra- or you know large scale produced uh, cannabis that comes in a lower price point. And they're fine with it. I mean, I hate drawing the comparison to uh, to alcohol, you know, because there's such different, such of different substances. But yeah, my my taste in what I drink has changed a lot since I was, you know, 18 to where I'm at now. Right? Yeah. You know, start of a long weekend, you're going camping. I would walk into the liquor store. I didn't care what brand of beer it was. I didn't even care if it was cold. I just wanted the cheapest 30 pack that was available. You know, I was like, wait, you're walking the store. There it is. Grab it. There's no brand loyalty. I didn't care. You know. Yeah. Uh, that's changed a lot. Now I prefer a Napa cab over a cheap 30 pack of beer, you know, but, um, and I think you can see that with cannabis too. There's going to be like, I think the, at the end of the day, the largest market segment is going to be looking for, for value. Coming from large scale, you know, cannabis to go into craft in the Canadian market, which one do you see in the future being more prevalent? At the end of the day, both. I don't think that either can service, can can meet the needs, the demand, the market demands of the other. If that makes sense. So when it comes time, there's always a place for the a place for the big guys. Uh, it would make no sense for me as, as a small producer or even a small processor to try to get into edibles. I just I don't think that is, that economy of scale is there, right? Um, especially because I don't see much different from like a craft edible compared to a scale edible. I don't know if that really translates or a craft vape cart compared to uh, a large scale vape cart. To me, distillate's distillate. And, and I could be wrong. I'm sure like there's some people out there that are just like, you know, cringing when I say that. But I, I do think that when you're looking at cannabis as just sort of like that, that raw, you know, material to put into something that you don't really see, like it doesn't translate. You can't really tell whether there's a high quality product when it started compared to where it ended. I do think that large scale production will always fit that need. Right. I don't, I, I don't know if it makes sense for, for certain, even pre-rolls to a certain extent. Why would you, why would a company who's making pre-rolls go source like top shelf, you know, hand trim flour at, at that point? <laughs> I don't, I don't think it matters. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I probably a, a space for both of them, but with the current state of the market, we've seen <laughs> we've seen a substantial downturn in the cannabis price mm-hmm. here in the United States. What is craft cannabis flower? You know, you do per kilo, right? It depends on how you want to look at it. If you're looking at sort of like the like business to business, or or just even like the you Pol- can, you wholesale can, price, wholesale price, you can look at it per kilo. Yeah, uh, price per gram, price per kilo. It's an easy conversion. Uh, it's all over the place. I mean, it's dropped. It's dropped a lot. I mean, at one point, at one point, you know, ten bucks a gram was not unheard of. You know, especially if it's good product, and then that just dropped and dropped and dropped. I personally think, you know, in around that four to five dollars a gram, four to five thousand per kilo is not a bad place to be. I think that that leaves enough uh, meat on the bones for everyone. I don't like seeing this dollar a gram. What it, what really bugs me is when I know that the government's making more per gram on tax than the cultivator is. That's where I really take offense. And that's what's happening in Canada. I hope it doesn't happen to here where it's just a flat, you know, price per gram. What is what is the tax? Uh, so depending on what province you're in, I mean, in Alberta, I'm in the highest, uh, where it's a buck sixty per gram excise tax. Okay. And then it can be as low as a dollar. So it's pretty substantial. Yeah, I'd yeah. say so, especially when 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 you know some of the smaller guys. And I feel really really bad for some of the craft guys out there who are good cultivators and they went in there with the best of intentions, going, "We're just going to cultivate," but without having the ability to bring it to market through the processing license they can only sell to other producers who then can bring it to market. Yeah, so they're getting beat up by yep. bulk flour for sure. And I, I, I really feel for them. You know, so we hold a standard processing license which allows us to bring it to market and not have any cap on production, which is good. Uh, it still opens up uh, some other headaches, but in my opinion, it's definitely worth it because now you're not at the mercy of other people who are just grinding the prices down. So four dollars a gram is about uh, eight, almost eighteen hundred dollars per pound okay. in Canada right now. Is that is that packaged flour wholesale? Yep. Yeah. Um, what about you? Know, so what is the lowest you're seeing that that flour is going for in Canada? Like well below a dollar, like sixty seventy cents. Wow. So three hundred bucks a pound. Yep. About. Um, with with your business and your craft business and what you're getting for the current market market rate is it is it a sustainable profitable business i believe that it is and i i believe that and this is what i was i've always kind of hoped to see with the cannabis industry is that it it's not going to be this crazy get rich quick scheme that everyone you know i think a lot of people thought it was going to be but why can't it be like any other industry where we can you know put the time and energy in you know, allocate resources, work hard, but why can't we enjoy margins like any other industry? We don't need, I don't think we need more, you know, I don't think, but like whether you want to open a dirt bike shop, a restaurant, a shoe store, I don't care, any sort of small business, you know, I think most people expect in around that 30 points, right, is is reasonable. 30% gross. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but you know, that's kind of a good, that's, that's a good range. I don't think cannabis, I don't think it's unreasonable for, for cannabis businesses, large and small to expect that. I think if you're going for 50, 60, 70, I think you're just being greedy. And I think if you're going to try to survive on 5%, I think, well, I don't think you're going to. not going to make it. No. So I think we'll get there. Yeah. I think that's where consistency comes in. Um, because that's one thing that a dirt bike shop doesn't have. They, their, their entire crop doesn't, you know, doesn't get killed over mm. fusarium or a pathogen in the root zone or bug outbreak where, you know, consistency in your fertilizer, consistency in your lighting, the right build, the right time, you know, is, um, is crucial. Well, and the other thing that I find really interesting, and we've seen this since the pandemic, is when supply chains got disrupted in any way, shape, or form, you'd walk into a store, and we you talked about it earlier, you know, when it comes to any sort of construction pricing, and literally overnight, you know, you'd walk in to, to place an order, and things would sometimes double, triple in price, and you're like, why? Oh, supply chain issues. I wish I could say that for cannabis. Yeah. <laughs> I wish, you know what I mean? I could go to a provincial distributor, and then, unfortunately, they, they set the price, not us. But since when can we say, ah, supply chain issues, you know, oh, we had issues. I, you know what, my electric, my electrical bill went up, 
my water bill went up, whatever went up, you know what I mean? Costing more to ship some, uh, some product up here, some, some, some nutrients. So yeah, that gets passed on every other industry. We're allowed to pass it on for the most part. Right. And the end consumer pays it one way or the other. We don't. Yeah. With cannabis, it, the opposite is happening. You know, prices are going up and, and the sell the, the product that you're selling is going down. Yeah. And what's really, really sad too, is that the buyers for these provincial distributors, they don't ever see or smell or smoke the product. They go off a spreadsheet and there's this, there's this real, and it drives me nuts. I don't know if you guys have seen this down here yet, uh, or if you will, and I hope you don't. And if you do, I feel for you, but this really, really strange, uh, priority placed on potency. This arbitrary THC number, which at the end of the day doesn't equate to quality in any way, shape, or form. Yes, we're we're already seeing that in the legal markets. It's and, unfortunate, and it's just and and I don't know. Like I, it really bugs me. And, you know, maybe this is this is an opportunity for me to sort of share some of the things that I've learned. You know, on a social media platform. But I went out and because it drives me nuts. You know, and I'm looking at some black market cultivators that are putting out better product than what you see, better than what you're seeing in the legal market, I'll say hands down. And not a single one tested above 20%. So I bought it all, sent it away for testing because you know what? They don't have to test and they don't, you know? So when they're selecting, they're not selecting based on a spreadsheet where it's like, oh, well, this cut, you know, yeah. this pheno was at 24.6. You know, the one that was at 18.6 might've actually had a lot of better traits. Might've actually just had a better feel when you actually consumed it, you know? And I mean, one thing I'd love to do is just, you know, buy a bunch of, um, buy a bunch of, uh, not dislet, uh, some isolate and just blow it out the door for like a buck a gram. Like, there you guys go, 99%, go to a dab, let me know what you think. It's flat. It's yeah. boring. There's yeah. nothing to it. You know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. I mean, we don't walk in again. I hate drawing this comparison. So bear with me. But do you walk in the liquor store and ask for Everclear? No. Yeah. No. You I mean, how many people look at, you know, a bottle of wine and they're like, Oh cool. This one's 15%. I'll go for that one. No, it just doesn't happen. You know, in fact, to be honest, if I'm, if I'm looking at craft beer, when I'm looking at a label, you know, cause I'm a sucker for a good marketing and branding. If I see a cool label on a beer, I'll look at it. If I see that it's like seven or 8%, I put it back. Cause I don't like beer. That's that, that strong. I actually don't really like the taste. It's a little bit too boozy for me, you know? So why are we doing it with cannabis? Are you seeing an, <clears throat> Canada, when you look at Canada and you look at the United States, you kind of see the future of the United States up in Canada as far as the cannabis legalization side and the progression of cannabis. Are you seeing it start to trend back the other way with more of these craft growers coming in and it not being such a THC dominated market? Or are you seeing it progressively stay the same or get worse? Stay the same or get worse, unfortunately. Oh, that sucks. There's been a bit of a push towards more, uh, definitely a, a, so definitely a move away from the large scale production. You know, the big guys aren't producing on scale at the same scale as they were at all. So you're seeing more craft guys come in the market because there's a demand for that product. So in, in one sense, we're moving towards that, that the craft end, uh, for, for especially for premium flour, for actual flour, right? Uh, or premium extracts that you can tell that premium flour went into it, if that makes sense. But we're still seeing this this bullshit, like just this this priority placed on potency, and it's it's really funny because on the federal level, Health Canada is making us put these you know warning labels. I think everyone's like, okay, I don't really believe in that at all, but whatever. It says that you know I think I can't remember, it's not the exact wording, but basically consuming higher potency cannabis products leads to greater percent a greater chance of getting schizophrenia. You know, so you got the federal government putting these warning labels on that have to be on, on plain package cannabis with, with a warning label, you know, telling people, like, stay away from the high potency stuff. You're going to get schizophrenia. I'm like, what? But then on the provincial level, if you have something that's not 20%, they won't, even, they won't even entertain it. And you're like, but you're looking at a sheet. You're looking at a spreadsheet. Like, how does that translate? And just like, nope. Ooh, this one's over 25%. We'll pay up to this much. And they're just based. And, you know, I guess I can't really fault them because they're based on sales. You know, they're going, well, this is what's selling through in the, at the retail level. This is what the consumer wants and you're just feeding. And unfortunately, a lot of consumers are really misinformed, you know? I mean, I would love to, you know, actually take one really nicely grown plant and just show people like, all right, let's take this top cola. So let's put that over there. Let's take one from mid, put it over there. This larvae kind of popcorn stuff that wasn't trimmed up, it wasn't cleaned up nice. Let's put that over there. 
let's test that and show people that one plant, the same strain from the same batch, from the same crop, just show the variation, the inherent variation and in potency throughout that plant. And the funny thing is, I bet you if you, if you actually bust that up and let people, and they didn't know what sample came from, I don't think anyone would be able to tell you which was the higher one. No, and they'd probably enjoy smoking the lower one versus the higher one most of the time. That's what I've realized. I don't want, when I smoke, when I smoke, I don't want to get blitzed and hammered. I want to have a nice, you know, smoke and enjoy, relax, chill. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know. But that we're not seeing people select for those traits anymore. You know, where people, we're seeing people select, you know, when they're doing their phenol hunt, they're like, oh, this one came in at 28. Cool. We'll run with that. But wait, was that the, like, you know, even above yields, you know, I'd say that right now, a lot of people are selecting potency first, yield second, and then all of their stuff that as cultivators, you know, we held so dear, you know, the taste, the smell, the yeah. effect, especially the effect, you know what I mean? Those are the winners where all of a sudden, sometimes those ones that really were, would surprise you, we're like, guys, hey, by the way, it might not look like much, but give it a try. And then you sit back and you're like, this is great. Like, yeah. I love, this is, this is awesome. This is my go-to. I really like this one. Like, yeah. I wish I could say that I'm not guilty of that, but at our facility in Nevada, you know, the team has killed off low testing THC genetics because there just wasn't a big demand for them. Exactly. And, and unfortunately, it's going to, you know, progress into, we're going to lose a lot of great cultivars and it's going to progress into just a THC dominated. But I think, I don't know, I have... I'm optimistic. I think that in the future we'll break the back of it and it'll go more towards craft beer. I, mm. I think in the future it has to, you know, as people consume more cannabis and become more educated, they're going to realize that, Oh, this is actually really what I like. And these mm. numbers don't really matter. And that's what I'm really hopeful for. And that's actually, you know, what I'm hedging my bets on right now is that on a small scale, uh, we can do that. And really, at the end of the day, it's not forgetting what an importance uh, the retailers play in this. And I don't mean the big, you know, value chain uh, retailers. I mean like the mom and pop shops. The owners actually work the counter. The guys, uh, the guys and, and women that are actually really passionate about cannabis. You know what I mean? The ones that um, open the store because they love it that much, and they're there to actually talk to their customers. Not the not the ones who are just buying in bulk and just trying to grind it down. I mean, we're seeing a bloodbath in the retail section right now where, you know, the big guys are just trying to, like, snuff everybody out. Some are working on, like, 0 to 10% margin. Straight retail. Yeah. Wow. So it's even rougher in the retail market versus cultivation. Yeah. You don't usually hear that. Terrible. Yeah. But they're just, but again, it's just about trying to just grind it out. We've got, we've got money. If we can ride this out longer than anyone else, we'll be the, we'll be last one standing. Is it difficult to get a retail license in Canada? Not overly. It's just pretty saturated, at least in, in, in most of the provinces that I'm aware of. I mean, maybe there's some that don't follow the trend, uh, but from what I've seen, yeah, it's, it's more, do you want to open one? Like, should you, is that a good idea? Like, yeah. will that location actually support, is there enough, is there enough demand uh, to actually uh, enough sales to support that location there? It's, uh, that's more that kind of the question. Not that it's hard. Uh, of course, there's some hoops to jump through and whatnot. You know, there's some fees, it takes some time, but it's not, I'd say it's, a, it's infinitely easier to get a retail license uh, than it is to, to get into cultivation. With BlackRock Cannabis, is that is that the package brand name? Is that what you're... For now, I'm not really married to a brand, and this kind of follows suits with my, my whole... I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, aversion to social media, is I'm a little bit leery of trying to build out a brand right now uh, and, and focus on marketing and advertising and whatnot. First of all, we're very limited to what we can do for marketing and advertising in Canada. It's very, very restricted. You know, they don't want kids even getting a glimpse of it in any way, shape, or form. Everything's got to be age-gated if it's online. Not that that really matters, right? But, yeah. 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 <laughs> but it more so... I've seen so much money dumped into the building of brands in Canada and that, you know, these branding plays that you keep hearing about and cool. Yeah. It's, it's a nice logo. Like I like the, it, it, I like it, but what are you trying to do? Like, I remember it wasn't that long ago. You didn't need to, to market or advertise cannabis. It sold itself. People knew what, <laughs> why they wanted it, why they consumed it. You know, I think it's so pretentious to jump up there and try to tell people you need to, you know, you're less than, or you need, your life will be better, you'll be cooler, whatever, if you buy my cannabis over that guy's. You know, essentially that's kind of what advertising marketing is, is you're trying to like tell people that 
they need a product for whatever reason, right? And I remember I read somewhere, I think on a day-to-day basis, we're exposed to like over 50,000 brand elements, you know, where it's a logo on the back of the car, you know, the coffee mug, whatever. And like, we're just so saturated with it. It's like, I don't want to participate. I almost want to be like, I don't know if I'll be able to get away with it, but I want to be like the non-brand where we're not trying, there's no, there's no, there's no advertising. There's no, we're not trying to like make you make it look or feel a certain way. Just more on the retail level is really establish those relationships, especially with the mom and pop stores where if you know, you know. And so when like, and again, it's such small volumes and that's why I think it might work. That's why I should, sorry, not, I don't think that's why I know it will work because it's small enough. It's going to take a little bit longer to roll out and that's okay. But I'd rather personally and not pass this off to like a sales guy, you know, or like a sales team or, or some of these brand houses where you just sort of like have someone else represent your brand. And, you know, I've been into, into dispensaries where you see these people roll through and they don't give a fuck. They're like, Hey, this is so-and-so from whatever brand house. Uh, yeah, by the way, here's our offerings. Um, yeah, you should buy some of the stuff. This one's pretty good. Uh, we got a new cultivator. Um, yeah, that one, they're craft. They're good. Okay. Bye. Or they leave some cards and some stickers and some rolling papers. Like uh, that just, I don't know. It's, it's so insincere to me. Well, what's even worse is a lot of these brands don't even cultivate their own cannabis nope. and you're having five, six, seven different brands being sold out of the same facility with the same product all under different strain names and going out to the market and it's all the same weed just in seven different brands. It's, it's, that's, that's the thing. It sounds like you're jaded on this brand thing. It, cause, cause I would be too it, knowing the information that we know that a mm. lot of the public doesn't understand and doesn't know and doesn't realize that this, the same weeds in all these other brands. But in my opinion, I think that if you were to create a, a brand that you cultivated in house and then you used a platform to educate the consumer on exactly what we just talked about with there's other things that are much more important than THC. There's this terpene, which does this and this terpene that does that. And this one will make you feel this way. And then this one's great to hang out with your family or, or this and kind of educate the consumer on the actual effects and you know, the genetics and different cultivars, um, kind of like what we do with Athena, but more on the, the consumer side of, of cannabis, I think it'd be cool. And then you really have something that you truly believe in. Look, I could be completely wrong and I, I can't knock you for, and I, I, I respect where you're at with, with a brand and, and, and I see why, why it's like that. Cause, cause there's so many different brands, right? And it's, mm-hmm. and it's kind of a big joke at this point. You know, everyone has a brand. Um, but if you had a brand that educated and guide the consumer and kind of fought back against the whole THC-dominated market, I think you'd be fighting against a cause that you believe in and, and consistent quality product that's not THC-driven and you can, I don't know, I think it'd be really cool. Oh, thanks. I, I think so too. Uh, and I think that's why the focus is going to be not so far reaching that everyone has access to it. Like again, it's like, I really, really see the importance being placed on the retailers where, and I also see an opportunity to, to really prop them up and to help support them. Right. Where instead of like trying to like advertise and like get out there to everyone in Canada, let's say, you know, Hey, black rock cannabis, you know, get it while it lasts. Yeah. Well, the reality is there's only going to be a few prov- provinces that carry it. And there's only going to be a few stores in each province that carry it. Right. Like I, I, depending on volume and, 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 and sales, like a sell through, you know, we're looking at at most 50 retail locations that we can support. Yeah. Right. So that's manageable. You know, and that's kind of where I want it to be almost like if you know, you know, and then like the people that have supported over these years, the really good, you know, authentic, sincere retailers, you know, I want those retailers to have, you know, limited quantities like, hey, I know you've been a good client. I know you know what's up. You got to try this. Yeah, I like that. I like that. No, I think that's uh, that's a good move and it's something that you can feel proud of. I think so. And, and it's just, again, establishing and maintaining those relationships with the retailers. I mean, that's what I really love. It's, it's kind of a, 
it's just trying to get back to like old school business. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it is. I, I don't know if it's, you know, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm against tech or anything like that. Cause I'm not, but it just like our reach has gotten so big that I forget. I think sometimes we forget how to be really sincere and authentic, you know, just with, you know, like I kind of want to, it's cool that we have access to the whole world, but I, I kind of want my world to be a bit smaller. You know what I mean? And a little bit more personal. Yeah. I don't, I don't want the whole world. I just want my world to be, you know, filled with cool people and good people. And I want to work with those people and live with those people. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, being, being one of the founders of Arroyo and then coming from that where you didn't know some of the employees, you know, that you're working with every day to now, um, what you're bringing in now, uh, which is more, you know, craft and for employees and, uh, um, well, and it's also, I think it, I know it's going to sound this, I don't want to jump off the hippie deep end too much, but it's almost like there's something that gets imparted into your product, you know, and, and they'll almost use the example of like, um, a home cooked meal, right? So you can go to someone's house and they make you a nice lasagna. And there's something about it because it's like, they take the care, the time, the tension to like cook something nice for you. Now you can go and get the same lasagna made from the same, literally the same ingredients, but it's like, you know, one of those frozen lasagnas made in some big, you know, factory and the nutritional value is exactly the same. Ingredients are the same. Calories are the same. Everything's the same, but they're not the same. They're just not. I'm sorry. And I think, I think it's just, uh, you know, again, whether it's energetic, whether it's intentional, I don't know. There's something more to it that I would say when you have good intentions and you got good people and there's a lot of positivity that you put into that product while you're making it. I do think it translates that way. And, you know, we're seeing it where, you know, so every three weeks, we're on a three week rotation, we'll load up uh, from the nursery, uh, you know, throw them in the sprinter van, load them up, drive a load up of plants. Uh, so we don't chew up our, our canopy space for the production site, right? So the micro is only only flowering. That's all we do. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll have pre-veg plants I bring up. We'll load up the uh, room. I'll bring back the, the finished product that they've got in bulk format. Uh, so we can process it back down in Calgary. That's about a three hour drive, but we're all there. You know, we actually pick up like, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the most important members of our team, we pick her up almost halfway there. She jumps in the car with us or in the van with us. We head up there. And then once we're done loading the room, you know, we don't just like order a pizza or something like that. Like my buddy dragon up there who, who's property we built the facility on, like they, he, he brings the whole team into his, their house, you know, and his girlfriend, his awesome girlfriend, Crystal cooks up this like huge like meal for everyone. You know, the one time one of the guys like smoked brisket and it was the best brisket I've ever had. And it's this family thing where we all sit around and eat and have this like wicked lunch. And it's not just about, you know, a pr- another production meeting. It's yeah. just, a, and, and I really do think that it translates. You know what I mean? Where it's just like, this wasn't about putting together, pr- uh, you know, a business plan that was going to work based on this percentage point or that percentage point or whatever. It was more just to like do something and like build a good quality of life for everyone. You know, like uh, that we all share in. We all have a good quality of life. We like our jobs. Everyone feels respected. Everyone knows that they they play an important role, and we kind of equally share in it, right? And I think even on a small scale, that the dollar amount might be lower per year in terms of revenue. I think there's more to go around. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're going to be profitable in our first year. Whereas, and this is nothing against Aurora. And I don't think they could have done anything differently. And I hold no ill will against anyone. I mean, looking back, I don't think you could have done it any differently. Uh, they still haven't turned a profit. Yeah. Right? So I don't know. Is bigger or better? I personally believe no. And that's not a knock. It's just there's different ways to do things. And, and the way that my brain works, the way that I can wrap my head around things, I like the smaller scale. I like that. I like things to be a bit more intimate. I like things to be authentic. I like things to be sincere. And that's why this works for me. And I do think it's going to translate in our product because it's going to move not from the, from the production site, the processing site to the retailers. There's going to be that, again, that sincerity every step along the way where I do think at the end of the day, it will show through where people be like, I can't put my finger on it, man, but I like this stuff. I feel good about this. Yeah. For growers come, just coming in, <laughs> new cultivators coming into the industry and, um, you know, new business guys or entrepreneurs coming into the cannabis industry, you know, what advice do you have for new cultivators? Grow what you want the way you want. You know, if you can do what you can to be an innovator, not, uh, be an influencer. Don't be influenced. 
if you can. So don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Just uh, go with what feels right for you and, and yeah, like I say, grow what you want, the way that you want. If it makes sense to you, I mean, the only person you got to convince is yourself. So don't worry about trying to convince everyone else. Respect. Chris, really appreciate making the trip down from Canada. Um, thanks for your time. Anytime, especially this time of year. It's not a, not a hard trip to make. Thanks, man. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.